Uh, my name is Asif Ilyas. I'm an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in hand and upper extremity surgery. Academically, I, I divide my time uh, one of two ways. Uh, one is my teaching responsibilities. I run our uh, fellowship for uh, hand surgeons uh, that we train at the Rothman Institute. I also serve as a professor of orthopedic surgery, so that involves me training uh, Jefferson orthopedic surgery residents and Jefferson medical students. And then the uh, second half of what I do academically is research. My main three areas of research uh, focus are um, fracture fixation and fracture constructs, particularly uh, upper extremity fractures and, and, and in particular the distal radius, uh, as well as I do a lot of work uh, looking at pain management strategies uh, in terms of uh, opioid um, consumption and other pain management strategies to minimize the need for opioids postoperatively. And uh, thirdly, I do a lot of work uh, looking at uh, uh, wide awake hand surgery, which I think is a burgeoning uh, area in uh, the upper extremity surgery world and I think is, has, holds a lot of promise for us long term. Yeah, so wide awake hand surgery. Uh, this is a really interesting area. Um, firstly, I think it's important to preface it by saying it's, it's not that revolutionary. We're using lidocaine uh, for surgery of the hand and wrist. Uh, lidocaine's been used all over the body for different techniques for, for decades and decades. What's distinct about, I'll say, in the world of hand surgery is that it, by using lidocaine buffered with bicarbonate to take away the burning from the injection, and then added with um, epinephrine, which limits the amount of bleeding in the surgical site. What that's doing is uh, um, negating our need for, one, a tourniquet to minimize bleeding in the surgical field, right? So lidocaine is meant to, to take away that need. So if you don't have tourniquet and tourniquet pain, you don't need to sedate someone. And also by having an injection that doesn't hurt to receive, so lidocaine buffered with bicarbonate, another reason you don't need to put someone to sleep, because if you really, um, identify why you're sedating someone for certain procedures, it's often because of the uh, injection pain of adding the local anesthetic and having a tourniquet up for a period of time. And a lot of basic hand surgery is soft tissue surgery, and the most common procedures are uh, carpal tunnel releases, trigger fingers, uh, decor veins release, mass excisions, really basic stuff that even, even guys like myself who do a lot of complex work, we still do a lot of this stuff as well. And you have to ask yourself, why are you putting people to sleep for a three to five to three to 10 minute procedure? And recognizing that when you're putting someone to sleep for a surgery, you are asking the patient to um, be fasting that day. You're asking that patient to receive an IV that day. You're asking that patient to receive anesthesia that day. You're asking that person to recover from anesthesia for the next day or two. You're asking the patient to experience the minor complications of it, such as itchiness, nausea, vomiting, constipation, et cetera. You're asking that person to bring a family member with them to drive them back home. You're asking that person to uh, see a, a medical professional beforehand for, for clearance. You're asking that person to go get blood work done. Maybe have them see a consultant, maybe get a chest x-ray, uh, et cetera. And you're also asking that person to assume the cost of a uh, anesthesiologist. So if you can do that effectively without that, you've, you've given the patient significant advantage in terms of safety, convenience, and cost savings. Basically, any procedure of the fingers, any single one can be done this way, from a joint replacement of the PIP joint to an, uh, an amputation of a fingertip to any fracture work you can do in this way, and, and we routinely do in this way. You can also do more involved our work such as basal during arthroplasties. Some folks are doing even fracture work more proximally. In my own personal practice, I'm doing 50% of my cases now in a wide awake hand surgery fashion, and I, I set aside a dedicated day to do those cases because it's a different flow, it's a different uh, approach to those patients than the, than the days that I'm doing my cases where I'm anesthetizing my patients in the traditional way. As I started dabbling with this about five, six years ago, it was interesting to kind of see how patients respond to it. Uh, patients are actually quite uh, receptive to it because from their perspective, this is not new for them. They go through this anyways. If you see a dermatologist, you see a dentist, you see a plastic surgeon, uh, they already do a lot of these procedures in the office under a local anesthetic. So that concept is actually not uh, that new to them. Uh, what's new is doing this in a surgical center or such an equivalent facility under just local anesthetic. It's more the, more the surgeons who are reticent, and that's because our training, myself included, is uh, biased that if you're having a surgery, the patient's going to sleep. 
it's looking at that in a new way, saying, do I really need to have a patient asleep to release their trigger finger? Um, is there really a need necessarily to do that? And can I do that uh, in a different way? That's where the reticence is. It's not really on the patient side. Most of the advantage I had mentioned previously is to the patient, right? Their cost savings, their health safety, their, their complication savings, their, their convenience, uh, convenience with it. But really where it becomes most valuable to me is the fact that I can, uh, A, um, educate that patient during the procedure uh, about what I'm doing and what to do afterwards. So that actually saves me a lot of time afterwards. I've done the work and the speaking at the same time versus having these conversations afterwards uh, uh, again, if you will, or, or, or later. Um, I don't have to have a, as many post-operative visits because I've, I've done that education with them during the procedure, not afterwards. Um, and particularly in certain procedures where I'm repairing something, I, and, and specifically tendon repair surgery, it's extremely helpful because now after I do a repair under local anesthesia only, I can then have the patient stress that repair by actively moving that repair site or something as basic as a trigger finger release, I can have them move the finger after the release to make sure that there's no residual catching or triggering that's happening. That's a, that's a huge advantage in terms of um, maximizing outcomes. And also, the other uh, last benefit of that is that patients have a real appreciation for what you've done. They've been there for a while. They're watching what you're doing. And if something goes amiss, I have found that they're much more understanding of it and or take more responsibility. Like, I'm sorry I did this or didn't do that or I didn't, et cetera, versus when you're oblivious of what's happened, there's, that's, there's less ownership of it. When they're involved and they're, and they're observing, there's a lot more ownership of it. So that's been an unexpected benefit of, of this. Um, that it, and, I, and I tell my trainees that if you're going to start doing wide awake hand surgery, the best procedures to start them with are trigger finger releases and flexor tendon repair surgeries. They're the easiest to do and they're the most advantageous and you can really kind of cut your teeth on those until you get confident with the technique.